The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. All right, uh, as, as you mentioned, my name is Ryan Cook. I'm with uh, Aslan FRP. I'm going to talk a little bit about a uh, case study we did on the I-635 bridge project in Kansas City, Kansas. So talking with the state bridge engineer a number of years ago, he said we would use an FRP in particular, GFRP rebar in a bridge deck when hell froze over. Um, don't really know the state of hell right now, but I can tell you we are using GFRP rebar in bridge decks in major projects. So the typical problem we see with a bridge deck is that the steel reinforcing is going to corrode. The, when it corrodes, it expands and causes the concrete to spall off and leaves us with these very undesirable holes in our bridge deck. The traditional problem that, or the traditional approach we see is to find some way of protecting that steel. There's a lots of different ways we try to do it. We're going to add admixtures. We're going to increase the concrete cover. We may put an epoxy overlay on it. We may coat the steel with epoxy or galvanizing, something like that. Overall, all of these approaches fail. I mean, I think we've all seen the state of the bridge decks and how they've uh, corroded and failed. So we kind of have to ask the question, you know, why not get rid of the steel? That, that's the problem. Let's use something that doesn't rust or corrode. Let's use an FRP rebar. And because it's not going to rust or corrode, it's going to substantially increase the service life of that bridge deck. So the benefits of an FRP um, are, are, are a lot. Uh, the biggest one is that they're impervious to chloride attack. So it means they're never going to rust or corrode. They have higher tensile strengths. Uh, they're a quarter of the weight of steel. This actually turns out to be a fairly significant benefit when installing. We can actually install more quicker. They're transparent to magnetic fields. Um, that's actually very useful in like an MRI room in a hospital. And they're electrically and thermally non-conductive. So what is an FRP? An FRP is a fiber reinforced polymer. And, and honestly, it's actually quite analogous to reinforced concrete. We've got a high strength tensile material embedded in some form of a binding matrix. So when we look at an FRP, we've got the fibers that are carrying all the structural load, and they're usually made of either glass or carbon, embedded in the binding matrix, which is analogous to that concrete. And there in the binding matrix is typically a vinyl ester or an epoxy. So the material properties, one of the things I want to highlight here is, is the stress-strain curve. Um, with steel, we're used to that nice, flat yield plateau where we don't get that with an FRP material. They're linear elastic all the way up till failure. One of the other differences we see with an FRP is that they're anisotropic, meaning that the properties are different in orthogonal directions. So one of the things that uh, people do, uh, describe an FRP project a as novel, um, I, I really don't like that term. The FRPs have been produced since, you know, the mid-80s. You know, they've been used in bridge decks since the early 90s. And so, you know, I mean, these things are 20 to 30 years old. They've been used in 19 different states here in the U.S. and more than 50 installations where FRP bars were used in the bridge deck. In Canada, we see actually closer to 200 installations where we use bars in bridge decks. And so, to me, I, I don't think that's novel anymore. I think we've actually, we've seen it and we, we've got a lot of experience with it. So, um, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk to you about the I-635 project. It was a project done just last summer for Kansas DOT. The uh, bridge was constructed originally in the 1960s and had roughly a 230-foot span using 48-inch deep plate girders. The uh, bridges have had a history of uh, overlays, repairs, and widenings. So as we look here, um, we can kind of see some of the, uh, the repairs that have been done. We can see the patchwork all along the bridge. And we can see some of the repairs that still need to be done. Now, if we look at the bottom of the deck, um, this is really where it gets bad. You can see that the, the clear cover has completely spalled off the reinforcing. Uh, that, that's a very bad situation, especially when you've got cars driving underneath that. 
So one of the nice things about this project is it had twin bridges. We had north and south down lanes, and when one of them was reinforced with epoxy coated steel, and one of them with GFRP. It actually gave us a very good opportunity to compare the differences between the two. So when we designed for epoxy coated steel, we used the Ashto LRFD bridge design guide or bridge design specifications. When we used GFRP reinforcing, we used the Ashto design guide spec that was produced in 2009. Now, as you can see, you know it's not a huge document. It's really supplementary toward to that Ashto design guide. And so we didn't try to reinvent the wheel. We just tried to took the same things that are there and just modify them to be used with GFRP reinforcing. So one of the differences we do see with uh, GFRP versus steel reinforcing is that we take that guaranteed value, that ultimate tensile strength from the manufacturer, and we're going to reduce that using this environmental reduction factor. In this particular case, that turns out to be 0.7. So we end up with a design strength of about 77 KSI. So. When we design for GFRP, as with steel, we design for a unit strip method. The ultimate design moment is 11 kip feet. And we're going to use number six GFRP bars at six inches on center, giving us a row value of 0.012, which is larger than the row balance of 0 0.078 or 0 0.078, meaning we end up with concrete crushing as our failure mode. Uh, in this particular case, we can see that row F is actually greater than 1.4 row balance, which will affect our fee factor, and we're going to end up with a fee factor of 0.65. So the actual stress in the bar is 60 KSI. Um, this is just an unfortunate coincidence. Um, it is, you know, for this project it was 60 KSI. We don't actually necessarily use that in every project. So when we calculate the flexural capacity, uh, it's actually very similar to steel. Really the only difference is in the term F sub F, where we're used to F, you know, the yield stress. And again, that's kind of why I mentioned it's unfortunate that the 60 KSI is what the uh, calculated stress in the bar was. So continuing on with comparison, using our number six is at six with a two inch clear cover. And, and we're able to reduce the clear cover because we're not worried about corrosion. Half the reason we have such big clear cover is just to protect that steel. So we end up with a reduced nominal capacity of 15.7 kip feet compared to steel of 13.1. So using the sixes at six, we end up with about 70% efficiency compared to uh, this epoxy coated steel of about 85%. So one of the things though, and why we're, we're not as concerned with, with that low utilization is surfaceability is gonna control my design probably 95% of the time. And so we have to check creep and fatigue and then crack what's next. So when we look at fatigue, one of the nice things about GFRP is we actually don't care. Um, we instead look at the creep rupture and we limit that to some percentage of the guaranteed ultimate design strength. Uh, in this case, that happens to be 20%, uh, leading to a, a maximum service level stress of 15.4 KSI. The actual stress under service level conditions is 15.2, so we're happy. So I mentioned cracking is actually going to control the design the bulk of the time. So we, uh, we increase the allowable crack width to 0 0.02 inches from steel. Um, and again, really the biggest reason we check crack widths for steel is to make sure that we're not going to allow chlorides to get to the steel and to degrade it. We check this at service level stress, you know, making sure that the, the expected stresses with this particular project, the predicted crack width was 0 0.036 inches. Uh, we, we can see that is higher than the crack width allowable. So we're going to add fiber reinforcing just to bring that in. Um, one of the reasons we're, we're a little less concerned, I think, with this as well, uh, currently Ashto uses a default value in the equation, which, which turns out to be fairly conservative. And so we think actually this is probably closer to about 0 0.22, 0 0.23, or 0.022. So with the fibers, again, now we're happy. So and as, as I mentioned, we had the comparison between the two decks. They're more or less uh, equal in size. I think the GFRP deck was about 1% bigger, or, or used 1% more concrete, I guess. But in any case, we can look at that and we can compare exactly what the cost premium was. So when we look at the cost of the GFRP deck, we did have some steel reinforcing on the barrier walls, so we have 30000 for that. 
We've got another 184,000 for the GFRP reinforcing, which leads to a total cost of about $213,000. We compare that to the steel deck of about 180,000. Then we add in the cost of the concrete, and for the uh, GFRP deck, we end up with 597 compared to six or 564. So overall, that's about a 6% increase to use GFRP. So when we look at just the reinforcing, we end up with $213,000 compared to $180,000 for the steel reinforcing, which results in about an 18% increase. Um, I, I think that's a little bit uh, overly simplistic. I think you really do have to factor in the concrete, and actually there's quite a few other costs that go along with it. And so when we look at the total redeck, uh, this includes mobilization and some of those other things that you would have to pay to build this bridge. We end up with 721000 for the deck, for the GFRP deck, and 685 for the epoxy-coated steel deck. So the overall increase there was only about 5%. Um, now, admittedly, I'm kind of biased. I'm, I'm an advocate for GFRP, but to me, that, that really seems like a small price to pay to get many years of additional service life. So looking at uh, some of the photos from the project, um, here you can see the bars being offloaded. Uh, one of the nice things, you know, with GFRP bars, we, we try to make them as similar to steel as we can. And so, you know, we can ship long lengths. Uh, these were 50 plus foot bars. Um, 56 is the number that sticks in my hand. So again, very, very convenient. As you can see here, uh, another big question we get is, can you bend the GFRP rebar? Uh, absolutely we can. Uh, you can see here, right on the edge, we've got some bent bars to, you know, to, to carry that cantilever load. However, with this particular project, uh, Kansas DOT wasn't comfortable using GFRP bars in the uh, barrier wall, and that, uh, so they used uh, epoxy-coated steel for that area. And you know, the other question we inevitably will get is how do you tie the stuff? Uh, we recommend using epoxy-coated or a PVC-coated tie wire. Very simple, uses the same construction methods as you're used to, minimizing you know, the, the expense of trying to train somebody to do something new. So with that, I think I've got a couple minutes for questions, hopefully. Yes. I think you said that uh, with the, f the fiber bars in the deck, you had more than row balanced of steel. How, uh, thick, how thick was the deck? I mean, this seems like a strange thing to arrive at. Um, it, the, the deck was nine inches thick, and it was row balanced for the GFRP, um, which was presumably higher than the steel anyway. But so it was a nine inch thick deck, um, and, and that's very common actually. Um, when we get uh, the FRP rupture, we actually get really penalized pretty hard with the uh, fee factor being 0.55. Uh, the other problem too is if we use less than row balanced, and, and again, this is a shift from what we're used to with steel, um, we actually prefer that, that condition because we get what we, what we call a, a more ductile failure than what we would with uh, FRP rupture. So I know it's, a, it's backwards thinking, but by the time we satisfy the serviceability, um, we, we end up usually using the uh, overbalanced or over-reinforced condition. Thank you.